is 9-11 Freefall. Welcome to 9-11 Freefall. I'm your host, Andy Steele. My guest today is Robin Horden. Robin is a former air traffic controller. He's also a great 9-11 truth activist. And we'll be talking tonight about civil informationing, what that is and how that is effective in getting the word out about the issue we cover every week on this show, the controlled demolition of the three towers that fell in New York on 9-11. And of course, the other issues associated with 9-11 and 9-11 Truth too. He'll be talking a little bit about that, uh, drawing from his own experience uh, about the uh, lack of air defenses on that day. So I'll be playing that for you in just a few seconds. It's another long interview. Uh, before I do play that for you, we're going to do what we do every week. We're going to take our 10 seconds of silence to remember the victims of 9-11 and their families and all the people who died in the wars that followed 9-11. We'll do that starting now. And that is 10 seconds. Robin Horden is a 9-11 Truth activist and writer. He's a former air traffic controller. He's also held a commercial pilot's license and has 1,600 hours of flight time and was certified in single and multi-engine land, single engine sea gliders. He's been a flight instructor and a ground instructor who passed the flight engineer's basic exam focusing on the B-727, and he's accumulated 2,000 hours of aviation mechanic time. He's here today. Robin, welcome to 9-11 Freefall. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity, Andy. Now, before we get into 9-11 itself, please feel free to elaborate on your background. Well, beyond the introduction that you just gave me, I think what is probably uh, my strength and the most pertinent um, background information about me regarding the events of 9-11 is that while I was uh, an air traffic controller, I spent several years in what we call airspace and procedures office. And in that uh, role, you end up interrelating with a wide variety of air traffic control facilities, and you're writing procedures as to how to interrelate with each other. And then within that, I had quite uh, an experience uh, in writing and uh, developing procedures that the FAA and the military used uh, uh, concurrently because all of those procedures simply have to match. And um, so I got a good handle on how the the military uh, and NORAD, especially military aviation elements, are supposed to work. And then additionally on uh, to that, I had, uh, as an air traffic controller, I'm part of the National Air Defense System, and so there were some clearances and there was some information and some uh, responsibilities during national emergencies and then also during the year to support uh, war games or aerial refueling or uh, other special military operations that would happen uh, during the year. Um, And so this sort of has given me uh, a very good insight into uh, what is a very complex relationship between the Federal Aviation Administration running civilian airliners and civilian aircraft and then uh, the military uh, running their very specialized operations. Um, It's really a pretty complex situation, and I have been spending years trying to unwind that bowl of spaghetti for people. It took me three or four years to completely understand it myself, working at it basically every day. 
and um, I'll be coming out with a white paper about that pretty soon. It's it's complex yet everybody's point of view that something went wrong with the NORAD response is absolutely correct. So I think that's just one of the little special elements that I bring. Well, you you, you bring a lot, uh, especially with your background and what you're saying, and you've been at this for a number of years. So I'm going to try to break it apart here uh, between the issue we talk about every week on this show, the controlled demolitions of the towers in New York, and the air traffic uh, stuff, you know, the the flight stuff. Um, so to begin with, because I've seen you've been at this for a while now, and I've seen you post stuff, uh, AE-911 Truth materials, what do you consider to be, just for your own personal standpoint, the uh, biggest evidence of controlled demolition in New York that day? Well, I think that the biggest ev- evidence is, uh, thankfully, it's uh, it's our gift that will move ahead centuries, is the simple observation um, that if if once people look at it without emotions, without psychologically manipulated emotions placed in there by uh, the media and uh, folks that I would call high perpetrators, high perps, or Peter Dale Scott might call the deep state. When people just watch the the two buildings come down, it's like, wait a minute, something is wrong. And then when you watch uh, World Trade Center 7 come down, people know it is a controlled demolition. So there's just no doubt about that. That doesn't mean that the average citizen, Andy, is going to have enough courage to nod ahead or agree with you or whatever uh, in a public fashion. They're so afraid of getting caught. Uh, But I find I'm in the streets two to three times a week. I really find almost everybody gets it. So without any question, the rapidity and the symmetry of uh, those buildings collapsing is 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 just overwhelming. And thankfully enough, point that I like to make all the time to 9/11 Truthers is that uh, they have um, they the high perpetrators they have coined the phrase uh, "never forget 9/11." And I'm psyched. Perfect. Correct. Never forget 9-11 where um, some type of insiders within this government either uh, did something nefarious or looked the wrong way uh, at a time that they knew they looked the wrong way of. So this is a uh, perpetuity thing uh, like the Day of Infamy in Pearl Harbor. We've turned that around. We are going to turn... Remember 9-11 around, too. And so I am encouraged more every week, and uh, and I'm very proud to be part of this movement. There are amazing people putting together amazing research and documents and evidence, and more and more and more we're having civilized conversations, which I hope to get to um, at the end, civilized conversations with the public. That's right, and uh, we're we're gonna get into that. I really love your approach, and in fact, I'm I'm ashamed that I'd never even heard of your approach and the term that you use, civil informationing, uh, up until this week when I was having you on. But we're gonna get more into that, not just in this show. I'll be talking about it um, in future shows too. I'm sure it'll come up. But what you say is absolutely right, and I've brought it up on the show before. Is when you remind people of 9/11, never forget 9/11, never forget. How they lied to you, how they lied to you about that, they continued to cover it up, they're probably lying about whatever they're talking about now, and it's important to keep on bringing this up because it it puts that doubt in people's heads, it makes people more vigilant. Now, a common question I ask people, and again, getting back to your background as an air traffic controller, someone who knows what he's talking about in this area, starting from square one, how did you wake up? to 9-11 from the perspective that you you see it from now first well it was two o'clock in the afternoon on 9-11 2001 um because uh in watching all of the events unfold i knew right away that something was very wrong 
because those four aircraft were not intercepted. Uh, I've run intercept, uh, interceptions, uh, saving a flight, uh, lost in clouds. I've been involved in a hijack, um, and I've been involved in uh, an aircraft that was reported to have an altitude-sensitive bomb, Boeing 707, I think it was a Pan Am, that we fi- had to find a high-altitude airport for it to land at, and everything came out okay. So when, uh, I mean, I know how fast, part of my procedural work between the FAA and the military was always to make sure that our military NORAD assets, uh, used to be called Air Defense Command back then, were absolutely at the ready with nothing in front of them once the call was made. So I know how rapidly uh, interceptors, A, get off the ground because they're absolutely at, st- they, are, they are at the ready uh, 24-7, 365 in open-ended hangars, Pilots are in the lounge a couple hundred feet away. When the bell rings, it's just like the fire station. Those professionals go. They have mechanics out at the aircraft in the hangars. As soon as their bell rings, they get the engine started. So there is a, it is an amazingly fast response um, that the military, during its war games, uh, throughout the year, would evaluate every scramble base. A scramble is, is uh, one of these interceptor, interceptor departures because everybody is scrambling crazy to get the a- aircraft going. And they would compete, uh, the different bases would compete, and it would be uh, a tenth of a second difference that would uh, go from, you know, the first place to maybe second or third place, in how rapidly their team got off the ground and in the air. So this is insanely fast and tense. To give perspective, part of the scramble network and air defense system also had to do with incoming ICBMs if they could be tracked and found. Even though it was a meager defense to these uh, type of uh, Russian, allegedly Russian missiles, still you get your aircraft up in the air and you go. Okay, so speed, time is of the essence. So I'm on 9 11 and I'm seeing these aircraft fly around for 35, 45, um, you know, an hour, almost uh, two hours and they weren't intercepted. This is balderdash. This is absolute balderdash. And uh, so I waited uh, before I came to my conclusion, and I had uh, said, okay, well, the only way that they didn't get any scrambles going and these aircraft didn't get intercepted is if there had been a major communications breakdown between the facilities. Now, as an air traffic controller, not associated with military operations, but daily civilian traffic uh, operations at the Boston Air Traffic Control Center, which is located in Nashville, New Hampshire, uh, a backhoe dug up all our cables one day, and our whole facility went black. And, And it was a really difficult thing to unscramble those eggs. But we made it. Um... But it wasn't quick. And so I said, all right, the only, the only way is it had to be a coincidence. There was a major cable break or a bus break or some type of failure to communicate between the FAA, who were watching the four airliners, and NORAD. Now, remember, this is, we've got no real information anywhere right now, okay? We didn't have, we don't have 10 years of information that we can put in reverse and, and um, reverse engineer. I'm going based on what I know, <clears throat> excuse me, what I'm seeing. And um, once I found out that the FAA and the NORAD, and NORAD, or in this situation, which we all know now is needs Northeast Air Defense <clears throat> Sector, once I discovered 
that they were indeed talking all the way along, I just simply said to myself, this was an inside job. Uh, and just a little antidote here. I, I knew it. I knew that this was being done to go to war because I'm a longtime peace activist. I've seen these these lead-ups and false flag attacks before. I emailed every one of my friends, and I said, do not go to war. Deal with this as a police action. This is designed for us to go to war. And, of course, I lost all of my friends, all of them. So uh, by 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock afternoon, 2001, 9-11, <clears throat> uh, 2001, I knew. Now, at that time, I did not come out because you have to have a re- – I'm a very real – realist and I'm a political activist and, and I understand how peace marches can be uh, undermined easily by infiltrators starting fights. I can understand how things can be flipped on its ear. And being uh, an ex-air traffic controller and being fired uh, by Ronald Reagan, the very last thing the truth needed was a fired air traffic controller looking as though he's disgruntled blaming, you know, everybody running down the street. It was an inside job. So I was very quiet until it, I knew that it was, until I found out that it was going to be right. I was quiet publicly. I was not quiet privately. I was working in the entertainment business at that time and dealing with writers and <clears throat> other people who were also in the anti-war movement, who also understood what was coming down, and who also um, understand that, it is just as important, and this is probably the biggest message that I'm going to talk about later on, do no harm to your position and your goal. And had I jumped out uh, and been that, then I would have done harm to the movement and harm to the truth. Uh, and really it was until I saw uh, David Ray Griffin up in uh, Wisconsin, hosted by Kevin Barrett, and read a book or two, I said, okay, it's time for me to really start to consider to speak out. <clears throat> and then when I read, I think it's Michael Bronner in Vanity Fair, the guy who ended up doing consulting in, I think, United 93, <clears throat> another uh, lie. Um, when I read that in Vanity Fair, that was it, because everybody... Everybody was going on the wrong approach regarding how the whole hijacking and how the whole thing happened, uh, because those aircraft were uh, observed by FAA air traffic controllers as suffering in-flight emergencies well before they were considered to be uh, hijackings. And so most people do not understand that the hijacking protocol is actually a slow building event, nor do they understand that uh, the system, the FAA military system, to cooperate on helping aircraft in distress, meaning aircraft suffering in-flight emergencies, have the same time constrictions that the military has in scrambling for inbound uh interceptor jets of bombers or ICBM missiles. So there is no sense in having a system to help in-flight emergencies, which are extremely time critical, obviously. Okay? If you're having an emergency, you're having it right now, and you need to have some help three seconds from now. Even though that doesn't happen, you just need some help then. So... uh on on the afternoon, I just knew something was really wrong because uh, the uh, interceptor should have been up, locked on, <clears throat> and frankly, it is, it's my professional opinion because I've talked to the military. I have talked to ex-air traffic controllers who used to be in the military, directly in the military, working for the defense agencies, and... I come to the same conclusion as does Gore Vidal in the film in which we are both featured zero, where 
a commander of an interceptor does not need any type of superior approval to shoot down um, before he shoots down anything. And that is, uh, this, I liken that to a, a cop on the beat does not need when he's when he's uh, trying to catch bank robbers or there's some type of an assault going on, does not need permission to draw his gun or even fire the gun. Um, <clears throat> doesn't need the, the, the police precinct's captain's uh, permission. That's their duty. Gore Vidal said it straight. That is their duty, to protect persons and property in this country. So those interceptors should have been on the tails of the four airliners <clears throat> and uh, the commander who would have been trailing America 11 down the Hudson River Valley. Incredibly smart people, incredibly well-trained, superior decision makers, knowledge about threats, war, militarism, armaments, knowledgeable about their responsibility, why the United States Air Force gave them that aircraft to fly in intercept circumstances. American 11 should have been shot out of the sky several miles north of World Trade Center 1. Same thing for United 175. <clears throat> United 93 was shot out of the sky. And then American 77 is just a long journey. So that's my point on where everything that I just said to you rushed through my mind on by between 2 and 3 o'clock on um, 9-11-2001. Something that struck me, and I'm I'm no expert on, on these uh, flight interceptor protocols and whatnot, um, but on this area of 9-11, I remember somebody was talking about this interaction George Bush had with a kid, and the kid asked him something about 9-11, and George Bush said that he saw an airplane fly into the World Trade Center on a TV and the point that the person who was talking about this interaction was making is that George Bush couldn't have seen that first uh, flight on uh, on a television because nobody had been focusing on the first tower except for the uh, No Day brothers, and that didn't come out for days later. So no one could have seen that unless uh, – unless well, I don't know. That's the question. How could he have seen that? But anyway, forgetting all of that for a minute. Bush said he, he heard about the first, to uh, first tower being hit, and he thought that's one really bad pilot. Now – He's president of the United States, had been a governor. I don't know how old he was, probably late 50s, early 60s, probably. Um, I'm just a 20-year-old, early 20s nobody in college, and right from the beginning I'm saying there's no way that they would have an airplane fly that close into the World Trade Center, that that could happen by accident. Someone must have meant to do that. Now, he's president and I'm in college, and it just struck me um, how bizarre that is. Why would he think that? I mean, could he be that? dense or or i mean it's not running through your brain that it's possibly done on purpose until the second one hits so that always struck me um but what always struck me too again not being an expert on this stuff is how washington couldn't have been guarded after you've already had both towers attacked in new york city that it wouldn't have automatically just been a complete uh no fly zone over the capital of the united states and that the the Pentagon could be hit. So obviously there's some problems going on there that morning. What's the biggest arguments that you get to what you talk about with the, the whole uh, interceptor protocols that day, the, the, the debunkers? What, what do they tell you and what's your reaction to those arguments? I want to break that out into two, two parts. <clears throat> I get answers from two groups of people. When I share with the average citizens – uh, what I just shared with you, <clears throat> I never get an argument, ever, not one. Uh, the only arguments that uh, I do receive come from official or semi-official or planted sources who basically forward the mean, this is Popular Mechanics, this is Bronner, this is a whole bunch of websites that are out there that are infiltrated or whose purpose is to debunk us. Um, 
they come up with the incompetence theory. And I really only have to explain to them a few of the points that I've already made about the immediacy of our military's response, and they have to, to stand down themselves. However, an awful lot of damage has been done by this major, well-orchestrated public relations program run through the media and repeated uh, continually uh, to the public. We all know on the inside, 9-11 inside truth, that NORAD has forwarded us three, if not more, versions on why it didn't happen. And um, uh, my view, my working hypothesis, is that there was a small cabal inside of needs and NORAD itself that were sort of behind the scenes making sure that there's diversions and, and people were looking the wrong way, doing the wrong things um, to make the delay happen. It's a very sophisticated thing that I'll be talking about in my white paper. But as far as the public is concerned, they they are aware, most of the public is aware of the Cold War and the USSR and um, Cuban Missile Crisis and so many things through their lives that... I turn the argument around on them and say, look, we've been supporting and building this highly responsive military and air defense system for, you know, a half a century, if not longer now. You telling me that you couldn't get an interceptor up uh, for 90 minutes? And the, the discussion is basically over. So, so they, without getting into gory or not gory, but um, without getting into the weeds of the intricacies between the FAA and the military scramble intercept protocols, common sense kicks right in. And it's like, duh, obviously. So, uh, this is why I never have I never have a problem. Okay with uh, a, a nice conversation like we're having, okay, about it. Now, if I go running down the street saying, you know, inside job and the Air Force deliberately stood down and, you know, there are all kinds of things and Bush order to stand down and all of these type of things, the average person is going to just simply say, lunatic. And so let me just go back. Don't open your mouth if you're going to do any damage. Do no damage. Be thoughtful, conversational, informational. If somebody is in your grill, um, just kind of let them go. Find somebody else to talk to. Right, and we're going to get into that, and I'm going to ask you, I just want to also just uh, to jump back because uh, to the point that I was talking about earlier about Bush and his interaction to the kid. While you were talking, and it occurred to me, someone might say, well, George Bush was talking to a kid. Well, folks, this was on television. You're still the president of the United States and accounting for your day uh, that morning, so it's kind of bizarre to, uh, I mean, if that to change your... Uh, story, even if you are talking to your kid, it's still on television. And that's all I'm pointing out. Again, I'm not uh, uh, trying to presume what's going on in somebody's brain. I'm just pointing out what I see. Now, we're going to shift here because you, you started in on... I, I, Andy, I, I can answer that because I thought you had shifted off of that. I wasn't sure you were asking me how Bush could have said that. And I can give you a reasonable working hypothesis as to how, in fact, I believe he did see it. <clears throat> and there are a variety of ways. We know that there is a, uh, a secret service whose duty it is to protect the, United, the, the President of the United States and others 24-7, 365, no matter where they are on the globe. We also know that there is an intricate communications network run by the United States military, we know that there are massive uh, aircraft called E-4Bs, 747s, equipped for 
worldwide communications on virtually every frequency instantaneously. And we know that the Secret Service was down in Florida with Bush. Well, the president doesn't go anywhere without him being, one way or another, at the ready to be commander-in-chief. That means that he has to have around him, in one form or another, um, information from anywhere around the world at, at his hand immediately, okay? So part of that uh, information is uh, also can be coupled or pulled out of the information that is constantly fed into the FAA air traffic control computers or into NORAD. They can get this data. They, their systems are designed to be able to collect all of this data. I will just uh, bring into mind people uh, people who have pictures of these big, huge rooms with screens all over it, looking at different parts and, and different elements, and we call that our Air Defense Command, and, and that's sort of how all of that works. Well, I'll, I'll, some of that can be refined and sent to wherever the president is. Uh, on board Air Force One, he's got similar information. So they don't keep the president out of the loop, uh, and that's not to say that George Bush was ever in the loop because, uh, in my opinion, he's a dunce and he was a puppet and he hasn't been. He's a what happened guy. But it doesn't doesn't matter, Andy. He he. I believe he had the information available to him, and there are many different ways that that information could have been presented to Bush through this portal. Just in the FAA alone, it's very easy to see with anybody that has any uh, knowledge about how uh, the air traffic control system works. Again, this is in the weeds a bit, but you can tell when an aircraft, American 11, for example, okay, uh, all of a sudden disappears. The, tar the primary target, the radar target of that aircraft disappears. So he could have been fed the same FAA uh, air traffic controllers feed that the, that the Boston and New York Center controllers were watching as American 11 sped southbound. And a knowledgeable person can say, well, there's American 11. It's got a track on it. It's a primary target. It's lost its transponder going down towards Manhattan, and then at a certain point, the radar no longer sees this target, and things change on the radar scope to acknowledge that. So Bush and the Secret Service and the people down there could have had that even that simplistic display. <clears throat> but more, more likely, or in combination, is that uh, somebody somewhere inside of needs or no red also had all of this very same information going down. So when he says that he saw the airliner hit, I'm presuming that he was able to see a, a digitized presentation of um, uh, the aircraft movement, much like a NORAD or needs radar attack or an FAA air traffic controller would have. So I don't personally see it that he saw like we saw the NATO brothers or we saw United 175. I believe that he <clears throat> saw enough information um, that, uh, that concluded that there was an in in impact. And then there are other reliable researchers who feel that <clears throat> tied into the same electronic communications network, there may have been some cameras, okay, uh, mounted in New York City watching the whole thing. 
Right, and that's actually a perfectly rational explanation that doesn't even have to be any kind of uh, foul play or conspiracy involved. And, but the, what I take issue with and what I was really focusing on is him saying that I thought that was a really bad pilot. And again, that has nothing to do with conspiracy. I just think it doesn't really uh, stoke much confidence in the American people when most people, I would say, were thinking uh, someone had to have done that on purpose. Well, well, Andy, the you know the history of the Empire State Building and what have you has that building being crashed into by I think a B twenty five or B seventeen and a bomber. Uh, there are um, experiences of lost aircraft striking antenna and towers and whatever it might be. Um, I think that Bush was kept out of the loop, and that he probably his job was to come up with the simplest. Uh, first response to what was happening to keep everybody disarmed. When I look at all of the events and I track down who's doing what and when and where, traffic control needs radar techs, uh, other people, I notice throughout that um, that an awful lot of people were very, very aware of what was going on and what they needed to do next but the triggering mechanism had been had been kind of delayed by a variety of reasons, mostly the hijack protocol. <clears throat> so I feel that Bush was never given the keys to the car to the country. Uh, we pretty much know that Dick Cheney was uh, driving, and that the, the the cowboy simplicity of this guy communicating to citizens in the country in the middle of the time that they are most afraid, the simpler, uh, the better. And so I maintain that that was really the core of why he would say, oh, it must have been a bad pilot. And if you take a look closely at um, Bronner's article in Vanity Fair, you will find that he may have made a slip and that he identified a, uh, a person at needs who he called an unknown trooper. And that unknown trooper spread the meme that it was a little aircraft that hit World Trade Center 1 and not an airliner, where everybody had been thinking it was American 11. So that unknown trooper, just think about that for a minute, Andy. First, why is anybody in needs unknown? Second, where in the United States military do they have the term trooper other than maybe paratrooper? Okay, so <clears throat> again, what I'm saying is that there are things going on that Bush uh, still doesn't know about in his own presidency, and he was called upon to just give the simplest thing to steer the people into believing anything but what it is that we in the 9-11 truth community are now uncovering. So he played his role masterfully only because that's the only thing he can do. That's fair enough. Um, now, I want to make sure we have time for this. Talk about civil informationing. Um, you have a great article out there. We're actually going to post it in the uh, show description uh, for this episode, but go into it, tell our audience uh, what it's about. Civil informationing is a concept that I came up with uh, in the early 2000s, right after 9-11, as <clears throat> we were ramping up to go into war. So I happened to be living in Reno, Nevada at that time over the winter, grooming some snow at the local mountains, and joined the peace community there. And when we joined the peace community and started to protest and do whatever it is, I just, I, it just came over me. It says, wait a minute, are we doing this again? What do we want peace? When do we want it now? You know, all of those same old, same old, same old. So it bothered me that, that protest communities had not moved ahead. And so it just, also dawned on me, you know, we've got this internet thing now, and we've got a couple of websites or links to articles or videos or whatever that we can write down on 
three by five cards or hand slips, hand this, these little slips of paper to people in the streets so we would educate them. So there's a difference between protest, Andy, and then doing something about it. And protest is essentially a complaint that then, because you're complaining, you're presuming somebody else is going to do something about it. And so I'd seen this go on enough in my whole life. I mean, in that, you know, I was 19, it was Vietnam, and, and virtually every action in war or violation since that time, I was in the streets about. So I just said, we need to change the thinking here. And I said, well, what? What do we need to do? What is that really, really, what is our goal? Our goal is to inform people because they have not been informed properly by the media or have been disinformed by the media, <clears throat> both, and then uh, to organize in different fashions uh, after that to get some stuff done. Now, we still are not very organized in this country, and we're still doing too much protest. So I came up with the idea of civil informationing. And the term civil is very critical here because, once again, doing the, the protest, anti-war protest type activities where we are announce where we're going to gather, try to get everybody from miles, hundreds of miles around to come to that place. <clears throat> well, also the opposition, which was uh, in Reno's case, was done by Fox News rallied their troops, and they had a counter-protest and basically overran the whole situation. So <clears throat> I was a peacekeeper at these events, and I remember it was the day of the thousand lips because I just stood between people who are yapping and yelling at each other and, and doing all this stuff, and I'm just saying, this is just not working. <clears throat> so the term civil is civil behavior, uh, civil conversation, that is so much more impactful. Just, just people listening to this radio, just read some of the stuff that Fran Schur is, is doing out in Denver. Um, civil information, civil conversation is just the best way. And then the other side of civil is civic. It is a civic, your civic responsibility <clears throat> to become informed yourself and then try to get your other citizens informed, too. So it's reshaping what it, what it is like to be a citizen in the United States, and it is in our democracy. <clears throat> it's a huge difference, Andy. There's a huge difference between doing nothing until it's too late, now you have to protest, and then becoming informed, informing others, having civil conversations, and then organizing to make things happen better so that we don't lose sight of them and we don't lose control of them and we put ourselves into a condition that our only uh, response or reaction less, uh, left is to, is to complain, which is in the protest thing. And the protest community has been so thoroughly inf infiltrated Okay, and the left knows this. They know that in the 60s, 70s, 80s, that the FBI and other uh, organizations have infiltrated all of these movements. And part of that infiltration is designed for people who look, smell, taste like good progressive anti-war people, whatever it might be, keep on reminding people or suggesting, well, let's go do another protest. Let's go to another protest. Even though protests have essentially not, people aren't going to believe this. Protests haven't worked for years. Maybe they work once in Vietnam, but essentially they really haven't worked. What has happened is that the only thing that has worked is organized political activities after that. But at the base of all of it is information versus mis- or disinformation. And so since the public schools no longer teach political science, since we have controlled news media, we can't get that information, but we do have this Internet. And that's what I was trying to bring to the people in Reno. 
and the peace groups have said, look, let's do some civil informationing down here. So I've been trying and trying and trying to continue to do that. And then when I got involved in the 9-11 Truth community, and we got the handing out of the DVDs, and then we had conferences that were maybe, maybe they were locker room squabbles, but outside in the public coming up towards 2005, 2006, it was still pretty civil in the streets, sharing information, smiles, good conversation, until the 9-11 Truth community itself was infiltrated by people who wanted us to confront the sheeple. And so this really stirred me to refine civil informationing because it is antithetic. It is absolutely every bit opposite of confrontational. Yet it is informational. And so I uh, was thrilled to fill out this paper that I wrote, Civil Informationing, uh, as a function of my experiences with what I consider to be uh, the really good, solid people uh, in the 9-11 Truth community. And I've been speaking out against confrontational street actions for years. And I have history, and I was on Manhattan, New York City, and we, with We Are Changes and all of those guys and bullhorning buildings and just all of that stuff that is anti-productive. Do no harm. It's amazing what you can accomplish with. It's just amazing how a person, in a personal conversation, in a nice tone, a little bit of facts, a little bit of evidence, will take and you'll make your point <laughs> way more often than not. Versus if you run up to somebody in the street and say, "Hey, you're a sheeple because you don't understand Bush did it." No, <laughs> no, do no harm. This is why Gage has been so wonderful. Right, and you know, I, I've done my share of that other stuff too, and I've been in this since 2006. I, I kind of, I want to say I kind of understand why some people reacted that way initially when you've got the the Glenn Becks and the Bill O'Reilly's, you know, sitting there demonizing you for talking about physics and common sense. But at this point now in 2013, um, I'd like to think that that we can move past that, and what you're talking about is absolutely spot on. I've said this before, is that it seems people are more attracted to the big showy protests and screaming and t-shirt wearing, and, and I'm not saying that protest is bad on, on right occasions, but there's also a tremendous need for just grassroots, hardcore, non-sexy activism. I'm doing a project right now. I'm not going to say talk about it until I'm done with it, um, but there's a lot of boring work associated with it, very tedious and, and boring work, but this is the kind of stuff that needs to be done, um, and I think my attitude is that the more things you do, even if it's small things like drips, um, the more small things you do, small things done well every day is going to have a big impact. And so that is what I think we have a tremendous need for is just people being willing instead of you know shouting at their favorite reporter or maybe not so favorite reporter about them being a, a, a scum or, or whatever, pick up the phone and call them and just have a conversation with them. Say, hey, you know, I, I saw you read wrote this article about AE and called them conspiracy theorists. What specifically about the science do you disagree with? And have that conversation. And that is going to have a bigger impact. That's what I think the other side is afraid of us doing. I think that, that they want to draw us away from that. Absolutely. That is that is exactly correct. That's why the We Are Change thing was infiltrated themselves because they wanted to get the anarchists involved in the black bloc. They wanted to have that street tone that had worked for them so beautifully in destroying peace marches in the 60s and the 70s. They got they're called agent provocateurs, and and uh, in the in the outdoor marches, and that's exactly correct. You you're you're exactly correct, and and. So, I mean, I applaud you so much for the work that you did in organizing C-SPAN, but I'm going to ask you a question, and it's a pointed question. Uh, there are a lot of politicians that get called in upon on C-SPAN, okay, and you did a brilliant and th just a pat on the back to everybody who called on that. I was so proud of that. And um, But here's the question. Did you do more good 
in convincing the politicians, or really were you using that C-SPAN forum to communicate to the people watching C-SPAN? What would your answer be? I was well. Uh, now I'm in the in the interviewing chair. <laughs> um, I was. My, the the purpose was to reach out to the people watching um, and to get that constant message going. And it's, maybe someday I'll do a seminar based uh, based on the whole C-SPAN campaign. But when people are hearing Building 7 Controlled Demolition, Building 7 Controlled Demolition, some of the questions were very repetitive, but so was the commercial head-on, apply it directly to the forehead. Head-on, apply it directly to the forehead. And it wasn't that smart, but it, everybody got to know that, that message. And so people knew Building 7 equals Controlled Demolition. Um, the politicians, there was outreach done to politicians that gave favorable answers afterwards. Someday I may talk about um, some of the things that, that went on. Um, but um, but essentially it was to the audience and to the politicians because, again, they started getting warned about it, uh, that they would get a question. So they knew that they had to do something with this issue other than just uh, do a phony chuckle and and uh, call people conspiracy theorists. They had to know something about it. Even if they had to go to NIST and get some talking points from them, they had to address something scientific about this beyond just saying all oh, those experts are conspiracy theorists. Okay, so, so let me rephrase my question a little bit differently. <clears throat> you probably had 100, just round it out, 100 politicians on with the phone calls. Let's, let's say you had. How many hundreds of thousands of citizens do you think saw or heard World Trade Center 7 controlled demolition? We've got 100 politicians, and then just give me a guess on the number of U.S. citizens who you think that your team informed and gave a chance to educate themselves. It's hard to come up with a round number. The, the The website of the show claims that there's three million people watching. I think that's what they said every single day. And then, and then, um, you know, obviously some people aren't watching all of the time. But somewhere, somewhere around there, I, I would like to think. And again, and I'm not trying to dodge the question. It's just that it's hard for me to know because it was something that just kind of developed on itself. But it, it, I would like to think. I mean, a few million people who had never heard about this issue. Okay. Okay, Andy, so here's, here's why I love all of you guys. You used the time of 100 politicians, a majority of which may never move on that, to reach millions of people. That, Andy, is brilliant. That is civil informationing. That is thinking outside the box. That is something that you don't get through a protest. If you let's say that you had uh, 25 or 30 callers, okay, uh, who you were in touch with to make the phone calls in. Let's say we had them all flown to Washington D.C. and we said we're going to have a march on the wall, and there's 30 of you walking down the mall with your little signs, or even if you wanted a bullhorn, the very same questions and statements that you asked on C-SPAN. How many people would you have informed while you walked walked down the mall? A lot of people. I mean, that's that's kind of the... <laughs> no, no, Andy. You wouldn't have informed anybody because nobody is on the mall in Washington, D.C., except for a few number of people who were protests. I've been there, 300,000, 400,000 people. The only people we marched for was ourselves. Oh, well, that's, that, and maybe I misunderstood the question. I'm thinking like you're talking to people, but you're talking about just a general protest. Yeah, I mean, basically, you get, you get lost in the whole drama of just having a protest. I get what the point you're making here. And actually, I mean, I agree with you. I agree with you. That's why I've always advocated this approach. Yeah. yeah I'm just trying to get, I'm just trying to draw you out to see the magnanimity of what the heck you did with your guys. You took 30 of your guys with a dedicated approach over a couple of years to inform, uh, you know, I'm going to say 3 million people because somebody saw it. Somebody's watching it all the time and they may watch it at different times during the day. That's brilliant. That's my point. My point is civil informationing is different techniques to inform the civilian population in civil terms. You, you, Andy, were doing civil informationing 
not even knowing anything about what I have written about civil informationing, you know? And so I, it's just really, really great. And, and you said that sometimes it can be lonely. Now, I don't know whether you ever got a bunch of pictures that I used, but I have, I put foam boards together and I painted, I just, I just painted a, um, a connective sign today, just finished it actually before our call. Uh, because I, I am a, a world peace or 9-11 truth guy. I see, I see 9-11 as the body of the octopus and the tentacles reaching all over the place, okay? So I'm not giving that up. So I look at 9-11 as the core issue, and I can tie about everything else in there. So being an anti-war person, uh, a major sign that I just painted today that I bring along with me when I bring my 9-11 stuff along with me okay, is uh, 22 vets suicide every day. Now, I'll bring that to a street corner, Andy, and I have a couple of corners in the towns in the area that I live uh, at where there are between two and 3,000 cars crisscross through these corners an hour, and I'm not lying. And so I push the pedestrian lights and I keep walking across the street with my signs and they can see it's World Peace or 9-11 Truth, 22 vets suicide every day, a bunch of other different signs. You know, I have a voting thing, you know, register to vote. So I walk across all four um, crosswalks, slowing down the traffic, making every bit of traffic going in every direction, one way or another being able to see me. And I do that for two to three hours. And when I do that, I might get one middle finger or two during the whole two to three hours, and I will get hundreds of beeps and thumbs up and peace signs and, and everything that is going on. So I am informing them by just getting them to read my, my little thing. That's civil information. Those are the best days of my week. They're great. I stand outside of high schools, Andy. I take the same signs. I stand out outside of high schools when the when the kids who can drive are coming in, and when the or at the end of the day when the kids are done, and I stand right in the visible thing, and I talk about voting or green energy jobs, 9/11 truth. Uh, you know, uh, this sign right here, 22 vets suicide every day. It's all tied together, and these are all good days. I get high school kids who graduate and say, were you that guy? I say, yeah, I was. Thank you. <clears throat> so, yes, there's a lot of secretarial dutiful work that you have to do, <clears throat> but my argument, it's far more effective than planning a march. That's right. And I mean, I'm sorry to have to cut you off here because you're you're on a roll. Um, you're right along the same lines I am. So you are going to be back on the show. I've already decreed it. Um, but we are out of time for this show. So I want to thank you, uh, Robin, for coming on the program. I want to thank the listeners uh, for listening. And uh, again, I look forward to you coming back. No problem, Andy. Thank you very much. And uh, I hate to say it, but I think you're probably better than you think. <laughs> This program's on every Thursday night on No Lies Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also download MP3s of this show from the Internet Archive by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele saying have a great week and good luck.